Hi, I'm Dr. Sarah Lucka-Gatopoulos. I'm an emergency physician and pediatric emergency physician practicing in Ontario, Canada. And this is my COVID diary. Before we get started, nothing in this podcast constitutes medical advice. My views are mine alone and do not represent the views of my employers or colleagues. By the way, if you missed our earlier episodes in this series, go back and listen to them first. This episode will make a lot more sense if you do. I look remarkably ordinary. It's not that I'm unattractive. I'm pretty average, and I think I clean up pretty well when I have to. I'm a bit on the short side, a little heavier than I would prefer, brown eyes. There's a little spot on one of my front teeth from a fall when I was a kid. I've got dimples, and I look goofy when I laugh. There's nothing special about how I dress, either. My closet is almost entirely black and white, with a few muted greens and a soft pink or two. I have a couple of fun and colorful outfits, but mostly I prefer easily coordinated comfort. My hair is usually just about shoulder length, though right now it's a bit longer. It's a pretty unremarkable brown color, except for one spot that's just white. I've seen bigger white patches and brighter white patches, but for all that, mine isn't exactly subtle. It's right at the front of my head, sprouting pretty aggressively from my right temple and falling to the right side of my face. It used to be just a thin white strip, but with time it's become denser and more obvious, and now it's the first thing I see when I look in the mirror every morning. And I always look in the mirror in the morning. I may be ordinary, but I'm also vain. You might not know it to look at me, but my skincare routine is an extensively curated multi-step affair. I rarely leave the house without at least concealer and mascara. My color palette may be drab, but I spend way too much time shopping for clothes online. I work out near daily, and while I'd love to say it's all in the name of good cardiovascular health, the truth is that I'm always trying to get a little closer to what I would consider an ideal standard of appearance. My vanity took a big hit when I developed my white patch. Some people are born with a white forelock, but I wasn't. Some people develop it when they're older, but I didn't. I'm not sure exactly when those first few white hairs began to crop up, but I began to truly develop my so-called Malin streak during my mid-teens. I was horrified. See, my mom has a similar white blaze, and I remember her desperation to cover it during her 20s and 30s. She absolutely hated that streak of hair, and still dyes her hair regularly. And hey, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But the result was that, implicitly or explicitly, I was raised with the understanding that gray or white hair means being old, and being old is undesirable. It wasn't just my mum, of course. There was an entire society around me validating and supporting the sense that grey and white hairs were meant to be plucked, dyed, and bleached out of existence. I started dyeing my hair when I was a teenager, and I kept dyeing it while an undergraduate in university. I wasn't exactly trying to fit in. My hair was platinum blonde, pink, turquoise, fire engine red, and the least subtle of blacks. But the one color my hair wasn't was gray. I was terrorized by my white streak, genuinely afraid of it and its implications. By the time I got to graduate school, my hair had been bleached, dyed, and fried to within an inch of its life. I was also embarking on a career as a serious researcher, and I worried that I wouldn't be taken seriously if the first thing anyone saw when I walked into the room was a shock of candy-colored hair. I already knew I was weird, and I finally came to the understanding that weirdness might not serve me well in the world of serious adults with serious business and ambitions. 
I grew out my hair, cutting off the damaged and bleached bits. My love affair with dye continued, but I took on a subtler palette, choosing subdued reds and browns, but still covering my shameful white patch religiously. When my roots began to show, I would part my hair strategically, hiding the white until I could make an appointment with a hairdresser. After graduate school, I went to medical school, and in my first year, I felt like it was somehow critically important to know how I would look with a buzz cut. So in the chilly midst of a Kingston winter, I shaved off the hair that fell to the middle of my back. I loved running my hands over my shorn head, even if I didn't love how cold my scalp got on the walk to class each morning. I loved how my morning routine suddenly took almost no time at all. I loved the idea that I had done something exciting and different. I loved seeing my hair at every length. What I didn't love was how my short hair seemed to grow so quickly that dyeing it seemed like an exercise in futility. As soon as I colored it, the boulder of gray came rolling back down the hillside and I'd have to start pushing it up all over again. But around that time, silver and gray hair became sort of popular. Younger people began dyeing their hair gray, silver, and white. People began letting their salt and peppers, steely grays, and time-earned whites shine through. I noticed that some people, young people, cool people, beautiful people, paid hairdressers good money to achieve the white blaze that I had grown naturally. People wanted the hair that I was so ashamed of. So I left it. I just let my hair grow in, white patch and all. During residency, my white patch grew denser and more pronounced. I jokingly blame it on all the stress, studying, and sleepless nights. But the truth is that I love my hair. Other people seem to as well. Sometimes people I don't even know ask me how I achieve my cool highlights. And people at work have been surprised to learn that my white streak isn't intentional. I used to hate my white hair. It embarrassed me, but it's become something I love and embrace. I wish I could say that I achieved this personal epiphany independently, but the truth is that I had to see other people rocking their beautiful grays and whites to appreciate my own. Now, I can confidently say my white streak is my favorite physical feature. It's been a rough few months for hair, though. I haven't had a haircut since January. My ends are split and ragged. My bangs are in that weird half-grown-out phase where they fall into my eyes but are still too short to be pulled back into a ponytail. Social distancing measures were implemented in Ontario the day before I was scheduled to see my hairdresser for a trim. Of course, I'm not alone. For most of us, the COVID-19 pandemic has meant shaggy, overgrown locks, outgrown roots, and general disarray. It's not as bad as it could be, right? Most of my colleagues have been wearing scrub caps at work, and I'm happy to keep my crazy mane largely undercover. But social media is a parade of pandemic dues, and Zoom has given us all a little extra insight into the private lives of our acquaintances and colleagues in their athleisure, makeup-free, with kids running into home offices and stealing the scene regularly. Split ends are de rigueur. I've watched a few coordinated and talented friends take up scissors and clippers. Nielsen data suggests that clipper sales have increased by over 160% as compared to the same time last year. Others have turned their attention to covering roots with hair dye sales rising by 23% as compared to the same time last year. What I found interesting about the past several weeks has been that it's not just about main maintenance. While hairdressers and barber shops have been closed down, 
I've watched friends and family try on all sorts of styles. Want to buzz your head? There's never been a better time. Always wondered what you'd look like in green or blue or black? Well, why not? Two colors? Sure. Three? Hell yes. Fantasy colors and deep undercuts have always felt a little counterculture, so it's been fun to see that even some of my most straight-laced acquaintances have a little rebellion in them. Sure, it can be a bit difficult to get your hands on your favorite dye right now, but isn't it worth it if hair dye is flying off the shelves and into the hands of the people you'd least expect? It was hard for me to learn to accept my funny little white streak, and it gives me a thrill of excitement to see the people around me accepting their own gray roots and crazy curls, or tapping into their latent creativity and dipping their toes into the water of styles outside their comfort zones. The pandemic has been hard, sure, but there are some happy things about it, some good things, some little silver linings. If one of them is that we can learn to embrace our little idiosyncrasies, let our guard down a little, be a bit more vulnerable and brave, then that's something, isn't it? Oh, and I guess I should mention that my white streak isn't all that white right now. I've been living in locks colored with lavender, pinks, and blues, and I've discovered that my white patch is the perfect canvas for a bright pop of color. So, where are we now? It's been a long time since my last update, though sometimes it feels like the days all blur together as we weather this pandemic. I feel like I've lost track of time. As of May 30th, there have been 89,741 identified cases of COVID-19 in Canada. That's almost equal to the population of the entire city of Kamloops, BC. It's more people than live in all of Niagara Falls, Ontario. It's almost as many people as live in the Yukon and Northwest Territories put together, according to Statistics Canada data. 6,996 people have died from COVID-19 in Canada which is a number that has more than doubled since the beginning of May. In Ontario, where I live and work, there have been 27,533 cases of COVID-19. 2,247 people have died. That's nearly 1,000 more people than the entire population of the high school I graduated from. These numbers aren't small but they're improving. People continue to become sick with COVID-19, and they continue to die, but the rate of new cases seems to be slowing down. As Ontario begins to reopen and we reassume some semblance of business as usual, we can expect a spike in cases, but I'm hopeful that if we continue to be sensible and careful, we won't be overwhelmed. The volume of patients attending the emergency departments where I work is trending toward normal. Wait times are increasing and the eerie sense of calm that characterized our emergency departments for weeks has been replaced by the knowledge that we must move quickly and efficiently, but we must also do it all wearing personal protective equipment. I'm excited when I think about a shift in the future where I don't have to wear a mask and goggles from the moment I walk into the department until the moment I leave. I look forward to being able to share a smile with my patients and welcome their families into the department to be at their sides. I believe that day is coming, but I don't know when it will be. Before we end this podcast, I want to thank Mary and Hugh. They are the heart and soul of this podcast, and I look forward to welcoming them as colleagues as they move through their medical careers during this historic time. Thank you to my colleagues who are my lifeline and the bulk of my social interaction during these strange times. Thank you to my nieces and nephews who I miss very much. Emma, Chloe, Jack, Reed, and Abby. Auntie Sasa will see you again as soon as I can. I'll be back soon with another episode. Until then, 
wash your hands, don't touch your face, and please stay safe.